Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Oliver, and thanks for being here on this lovely, balmy evening, um, which I hope to make uh, worth your while. Um, so, in the piece that I wrote that Oliver just mentioned for the uh, for the Joe at FEU Award Catalogue, uh, I just realised as I about to read this that I'm about to quote myself, which is something that I don't generally do. And I, I suddenly sort of feel overcome by shame. Um, but anyway, it's here and I, I'd better say it, otherwise the rest won't make sense. So um, I suggested there that art and psychoanalysis give expression to the nagging voices of the enigmatic and excessive selves that we can't get rid of. Those elements of our inner lives that can't be integrated or contained in our ordinary self-image. These are the remaindered, unwanted, or wasted elements of life that escape recognition. An important aspect of Lucy Clout's film is the labour invested in the news that's expunged, the labour is expunged from its presentation and its consumption. The bits of the process of newsmaking that are meant to be expunged are instead put at its centre. Instead of seeing the finished product, we see the wasted elements that make it possible, that condition it. And Mariana's film is full of images of waste, notably the dramatic, dramatic climactic representation of the rush of blood from Emma Eckstein's nose, or rather of red crepe from a massive papier-mâché nose, uh, that is described in Freud's famous dream of Emma's, Emma's injection. It's about what must be renounced, what must be, be made abject if stories about ourselves and our identity are to remain coherent. And indeed, something like this concern about what we need to get rid of or renounce, those wasted elements of ourselves that, we need, that, that, uh, that render us a coherent story to ourselves, something like this concern haunts these very different films. And that motif of waste has stimulated some thoughts about waste in contemporary life and art that I'd like to talk about this evening. So, she lay on her back, tilting languidly to the left. The bleached paper white of her slender shoulders hinted that beneath the ink black swamp of her duvet, she was naked. Yet it couldn't be called an erotic scene. The dense shock of hair splayed on the pillow radiated not desire, but indifference. Hovering over the pillow, the fanned fingers of her left hand might just have been flickering into life, but the imminent twitch seemed to anticipate something more like a spider's dying throes than a woman's awakening. Shut up alone in her bed and in her mind, she was impervious to whatever might be happening beyond her lowered eyelids. It was the mid-80s, and this was a fixed half-term ritual. After chewing my way dutifully through the dry nut roast at Cranks, I drift down Carnaby Street, gawping at the militantly joyless punks and skins, and strolling into one and then another of its tired dens of cheap leather and rock memorabilia. Sat on the counters were my only real objects of interest. Cardboard boxes and pinboards and small wicker baskets each loaded with little badges to be plundered for celebrated or obscure band names, obscenities, far left or occasionally far right slogans, as though at its outer edges politics congealed into a single undifferentiated soup. Sifting a box, enjoying the tinny plink, I turned my head and saw her heavy black outline staring down from the wall bordered above and below by the following words. I didn't go to work today. I don't think I'll go tomorrow. Let's take control of our lives and live for pleasure, not pain. It's hard to know what it was in this image or its caption that induced in me such overwhelming feelings of sadness and panic, a near physical sensation of plunging at speed into some bottomless interior void. It was as though a silent and invisible missile had been launched into the heart of my adolescent life, so replete with plans, desires and expectations. From this moment, 
A slow-release mechanism seeped a kind of inertial dust into my busy, purposeful days. Even, or especially, when my hours are full. Something of me remains forever in that bed. Not with her, it's not that kind of fantasy, but perhaps in an adjacent bed, sunk into a permanent lassitude, the two of us mutually oblivious to one another or anything else, and above all to the imperative to work, in any sense of the word. It was only many years later that something else struck me about the poster. It's uncannily Freudian sense of pleasure as undisturbed quiescence. Pleasure is sleep, and when you wake up, the poster implies, anticipating the great formulation of Lebowski's very disturbed companion, Walter Sobchak. When you wake up, you are entering a world of pain. But entering this world of pain seems today to be the sovereign imperative of our politics and our culture. Successive governments, left and right of centre, have been intent on keeping us all busy from as early to as late in life as possible. There's increasing public advocacy for the extension of literacy and numeracy assessments to children as young as two, or for the raising of retirement, age to 70. Disability benefits have been heavily cut amid ever more stringent and ill-informed bureaucratic assessments. Those pockets of the lifestyle protected from demand to learn, work and produce are being rapidly eliminated. Perhaps the time is coming when the privilege of not working will be expended only to the unborn and the dead. Running in concert with this political salt on the idol is a culture of permanent distraction. From earliest infancy, our eyes, ears and nervous systems are assailed by an unbroken stream of images and information beaming from TV, tablet and mobile screens. Our physical presence in the tangible spaces of home, office and street is increasingly absorbed by the virtual networks of digital life and their unremitting pressures to follow, like, update, upload, buy. The intervals away from our network devices induce feelings of abandonment and emptiness. The anxiety of an hour not already spoken for seems increasingly difficult to bear. The political and cultural imperative is stark. All our time must be put to work. Every moment of a given day, every phase of a given life, must be accounted for. Idle time, time without content, is a source of contempt, confusion and terror. One of the most potent images of our terror of time without content to have emerged in recent times took the form of a news package that spread virally during the English riots of August 2011. An interview with two adolescent girls, swigging rosé in the wreckage of the Croydon morning, formed the soundtrack to footage of a razed furniture store, flames still blasting from its gutted windows. They speak of the pleasure of lobbing missiles and looting shops, then switch abruptly into blaming the riots on the Conservatives and declaring that they're showing first the police and then the rich people, the owners of the looted businesses, that we can do what we want. But it wasn't the words themselves, I think, that sent shudders of compulsive fright through the report's millions of viewers, so much as the tone of breezy pleasure devoid of anger or protest, violence presenting itself in the unsettling guise of bubbling innocence. <coughs> Apparently circulated to show up the rioters' stupidity, the news package presented us instead with a Foundhouse mirror image of our own. As long as we could laugh at the incoherence and flimsiness of their rhetoric, we wouldn't feel the humiliation of being laughed at, of hearing their annihilating contempt for our carefully ordered world, in which actions, values, even words are meaningful, in which it's thought to be worth distinguishing between, say, the Conservatives, the police and the rich people. In the running together of these targets of blank hatred, we hear a terrifying intimation of an undifferentiated world in which the boundaries marking one thing off from another have dissolved, fallen apart. The world we thought was solid and, in, and substantial, their laughter tells us, is gossamer thin. It wasn't only the right-wing press that expressed shrill horror at this menace of spreading incoherence and collapse. I recall the disgust, along with the odd sense of betrayal, expressed by some of my leftist friends, 
at the aimlessness and materialism of the rioters and looters. They don't stand for anything, they lamented. The only values they know are brand values. The left and right share the conviction that the world should be one way and not another. Intoxicated by wine and lawlessness, the girls on the ravaged Croydon street flaunted their total indifference to how the world should be. Their commitment wasn't to remaking the world they'd unmade, but to their brazen pleasure in unmaking as an end in itself. Here is idleness, not as the new reign of creative freedom, but as a slackening of the will to hold up the world, a languid pleasure in watching it collapse through a rosé-tinted lens. It frightens and perplexes us beyond measure, and rightly so, because lurking somewhere in this idle nihilism is an image of ourselves. I know, it's about the most obvious example I could have conjured up, so... Um, I'm sort of sorry about that, but sometimes um, there is a work of art that does the work you need doing so so effortlessly for you um, that it becomes irresistible. And it has the advantage of, I know there not being a single person in this world, in this room who, well, yes, probably well, this room who doesn't know this image very well. In 1999, in the midst of so many millennial anxieties, Tracy Emin was nominated for the Turner Prize. Her contribution to the prize exhibit at the Tate, drawing teeming crowds of fascinated, baffled and sometimes angry visitors, was My Bed, in which she presented the titular bed in its supposed exact state following an alcohol fuel breakdown triggered by the end of a relationship. A disordered tangle of used stockings, towels and sheets, the undersheets spreading freely over the bed's base, was bordered by the accumulated debris of an exhausted life. A lonely, cuddly toy, used and unused tissues and tampons, condoms and condiments, aspirin and alcohol. My bed generated a storm of familiar tabloid ridicule and content. What did this display of life's raw mess, this indulgent and aggressive act of self-exposure, have to do with art? Concealed in all the contrived outrage and disgust was an interesting, if familiar, question. How can we confer the status of an artwork, an art work, on an object that seems brazenly to refuse the terms of both art and work? The Greek word poiesis defines the creative act, whether in natural or in human life, as a making, a transfiguration through work of one thing into another. Informally known as an unmade bed, not only did Emin's bed show no evidence of being made, it seemed to be the statement of a refusal to make anything. Its startling gesture was to leave the formless detritus of her disintegrating life undisturbed, strewn with no thought to their harmonious arrangement, to inducing aesthetic pleasure in her viewer. That this impression of disintegration was actually the effect of painstaking and artful work on Emin's part only amplifies its shocking indifference to the task of pleasing us. This is work that refuses to do any work, intent on cancelling out its own efforts. My bed served as a lightning rod for the rage and disgust as well as resentment the inertial state is apt to provoke in us. The noisy hatred and fascination with which it was greeted suggests the profoundly ambiguous status inactivity has in our culture. Our journeys to work are cast in the shadow of advertising hoardings emblazoned with images of taut, oiled limbs and glassy faces basking in the sun, stirring our desperate envy and longing as we stare down the barrel of the grinding day to come. In such moments, the idle state seems the most desirable and precious commodity, the Sabbath that would restore us to the world, enabling us to work and love once again. But idleness is also the demonic rebel against the parties of love and work, the siren call to forget the world, and fall into the voluptuous embrace of oblivion. I didn't go to work today. I don't think I'll go tomorrow. This oblivion made so unnervingly palpable by Emin's bed is not the divinely sanctioned rest of the Sabbath, which prepares our return the following day to the dutiful service of God, work and family. It's closer to the tohu vabohu that opens Genesis, the terrifying waste and void that preceded the creation of the world. 
Emin's bed provokes a horrified recognition of a, play, of a scene playing itself out invisibly and secretly in each of us, a spot in us that in the midst of our purposeful lives of action and progress would surrender to entropy, to the dissolution of all order and meaning of life itself. From the Bible's reproaches and warnings to the sluggard, to our tabloid's bilious rages against economic migrants and benefit cheats, inactivity has always been a source of dire prophecy and bitter invective. In these figures of shiftlessness and entitlement of other easier lives lived at our expense, we see the versions of ourselves we fear and repudiate, images of our shaming desire to sink into the inertia and indifference of sleep. The very idea of such a desire, to which Freud gave the name of the death drive, seems strange and counterintuitive. And yet, who hasn't felt, at some point other in the course of a life, or even a day, some hint of a death drive, and of an impulse to cancel out all impulses, to annul all disturbances, all demands, all efforts? For the later Freud, the drama and pain of life is rooted in the uneasy coexistence between this drive to quiescence and the drive to grow and change. We can see this drama unfold in any individual life, but equally in the broader history of the world. What we often mean by history is the realm of significant events, of transformations in the lives of cities, nations and empires, and in political, economic and social relations. This is the realm of purposeful and transformative action. And as such, we take it very seriously. We teach the great historical names and events to children. We build monuments to them and preserve them in collective memory. Its history is defined by work and struggle, by the ways in which human beings have striven to expand, change and master the world around them. In the making of history, we might say, time is used. It's put to work. Whereas, suggests the great French writer and critic, Maurice Blanchot, art, and especially modern art, so often stirs fear, anger and fascination because it questions and even mocks this life of action and purpose. Art, he reminds us, acts poorly and little. It's clear that if Marx had followed the dreams of his youth and written the most beautiful novels in the world, he would have enchanted the world, but he would not have shaken it. It is capital that must be written, not war and peace. Now, this isn't to be taken as a conception of art as apolitical or as a kind of aestheticism. Blanchot is suggesting something more subtle, that art's political force lies precisely in its renunciation of work, of participation, of activity, in its will to unmake, to undo, to unwork, rather than to make. I'll say more about this a little later. Poetry makes nothing happen, W. H. Auden famously writes, echoing the objections so often levelled against art by men and women of action. That in dedicating itself to an imaginary world, it impoverishes the real one. Next to the purposeful life of the active makers of history, the wasteful life embodies a kind of anti-history, a rejection of transformation and progress, a commitment to going nowhere. The idler rejects purposeful and useful activ activity, along with the wish to play a serious part in worldly affairs. Since at least the Romantic era, the idler has been the prevalent stereotype of the artist, the louche, stylishly dishevelled bohemian, dreaming away the hours in airy fancies and high-flown chatter. For men and women of action, whether the industrialists and statesmen who seek to preserve the existing order of the or the activists and dis dissidents seeking to change it, this figure can be dismissed with indulgent tolerance or stern disapproval as an irrelevance, one who adds nothing of substance to the world. Perhaps this is what Martin Creed is hinting at in his wry slogan, the whole world plus the work equals the whole world. Take works of art away and the whole world remains just as it was. can't not mention him in this context. Perhaps this is how Lebowski the Man and Lebowski the Film have acquired such a dedicated cult following. 
Like most of the Coen Brothers movies, it's an extended riff on itself and perhaps on all art as a waste of time. Ambling behind his own cloud of pot smoke, too lazy and indifferent to keep pace with the world, Lebowski is a harmless irrelevance, noticed only when mistaken for someone else, significant only when plunged into a story which isn't his. So why bother telling that story or watching it? Lebowski wastes his life just as the film dares to waste a bit of hours to take us nowhere and tell us nothing. This may be just why it resonates so deeply with us. It gives voice in a tone of deceptive lightness, the deeper and more unconscious nihilism embodied in the wasted landscape of Emin's bed and the blankly contented voices of the girls from Croydon. Taken to its logical conclusion, the indifference of the inactive person ceases to be harmless. Worklessness can be tolerated only as long as it remains within the sanctioned spaces of nightly sleep and paid holidays, as long as we can say that the world of work and purpose is true and solid, and the idle world of dreams and imagination is false and empty. As long as we can remain identified with our waking selves, the idle life seems wasteful, trivial, pernicious. But give ourselves over to the lure of lethargy and indifference, and suddenly it's the waking, real world that seems abruptly to lose all its meaning and importance. Perhaps this is why parents are so enraged by the adolescent child lolling in bed mid-morning or mid-afternoon. In their child's preference to sleep, they perceive a tacit mockery of their own busyness, of all the plans and aims, expectations and calculations for themselves and their children in which they've invested so much time and energy. We may all be familiar with the many ways we deny work the priority it demands sleeping through the alarm, losing hours to viral videos and online games, staring catatonically into the space ahead, prolonging lunch, sneaking home early. But we prefer to think of these ruses of time-wasting as aberrations, guilty seductions away from the path set by our first and best self, as though in wasting time I betrayed the efficient and useful being I really am. We cling to the Enlightenment's gratifying image of the human being as fundamentally rational and virtuous, even in the face of so much damning counter-evidence. Perhaps we have this the wrong way around. Perhaps the capacity we do have for hard work and productivity is instead wrested miraculously from the iron grip of lassitude and indifference. The fully formed human ego issues from a fundament of formless chaos, which Freud famously calls the id. The more or less organised self we show the world is a fragile artefact, a small pocket of coherence forged from a raging sea of violent and voracious impulses. The great thinkers of the Enlightenment spend much time engaged in a war against this precarious version of the self, insisting on the human being as a creature of robust rationality. Ourselves, they posited, like our civilization, may undergo an infancy defined by dependence, ignorance and irrationality. But the arc of the human story is one of progressive movement towards autonomy, knowledge and reason. The true aim and destiny of the Enlightenment self is to understand and gradually master reality, rather than surrender to, to the dim, childish urgings of pleasure. The slob and waster are for this reason the Enlightenment's mortal enemies. The slob's shiftlessness, moral laxity and hedonism a living refutations of its every cherished piety. And yet, the Enlightenment's austere condemnation of idleness went hand in hand with a certain fascination, even attraction for it. As Jacques Diderot shows us in his fictionalised dialogue, Rameau's nephew. Um, so, as editor of the uh, Encyclopédie, the first great modern encyclopedia, Diderot's life and work attest to his unswerving dedication to the moral and rational progress of the individual and the species. And yet, perhaps his finest literary creation is an epic slob and waster. Like many of Plato's dialogues, Rameau's nephew begins with a chance encounter that leads to an extended disputation on how to live. Unlike in Plato, 
The leading voice in the dialogue speaks not in the name of wisdom and virtue, but of dishonesty and vice. Ramo, a music teacher and one of the weirdest characters in this land of ours where God has not been sparing of them, as Diderot describes him, Ramo is known to the world as the nephew of a grand, though now unfashionable, musical composer of the same name. Diderot meets Rameau in an idle moment of his own, taking shelter from the cold and rain in the Café de la Régence, watching a game of chess. Their talk soon turns to Rameau's difficulties and their causes. Rameau lives by sponging off rich households, into which he periodically insinuates himself through flattery and deceit, and from which he's inevitably ejected from, for overstepping the mark. Diderot listens to his defence of an amoral, pleasure-driven, dependent and thoroughly useless life with both outward disgust and surreptitious amusement, even admiration. There's a knowingly perfunctory quality to Diderot's objections, a sense that he's enjoying his interlocutor's perverse self-justifications too much to spoil them with serious counter-arguments. In any, in any case, there's nothing Diderot can say about Rameau that Rameau hasn't already said of himself. Diderot reproaches him as an idler, greedy, cowardly, and with a soul of dirt, to which Rameau replies, yes, I believe I've told you that already. Forever ducking and diving, he fantasizes a future in which he'll squander untold riches on women and drink, while paying back all the humiliations he suffered at the hands of his aristocratic paymasters. Diderot lavishly, lavishes witheringly ironic praise on his worthy use you would make of your wealth. You would be most useful to your fellow citizens and most glorious for yourself. But Rameau is breezily immune to this kind of irony. The virtues of honour, seriousness and usefulness with which Diderot reproaches him are for Rameau mere vanities, empty words hiding under the pretentious cover of universal laws. In a travesty of Solomon's wisdom, he commends Diderot to drink good wine, blow yourself out with luscious food, have a tumble with lovely women, lie on soft beds. Apart from that, the rest is vanity. The sequence of the pleasures is telling, as though the sensual pleasures of good wine, luscious food and lovely women were all consummated in the luxuriant stillness of a soft bed the quiet annulment of all mental and physical effort. To train oneself to bear a life poor in food, amusement and rich in self-reproach, says Rameau, is nothing but perversity. It may, means embracing rather than minimising privations, willfully denying yourself what you want. Do we not see this conflict between the spoiled child and responsible adult writ large in today's consumer-driven economy and the culture to which it gives rise? The debt fueled credit crunch of 2008 and the long and deep recession which followed it, like so many recessions that preceded it, alerted the world to an irresolvable contradiction at the heart of consumer capitalism. Consumerism works by tapping into our infantile devotion to the pleasure principle. Spurred by the twin temptations of advertising and easy credit, we spend excessively, anxiously seeking the definitive satisfaction that finally eludes us. We're enjoined to be Ramo, the adult baby, helplessly enslaved to his own desires, unable to hold them at a distance or exert any measure of control over them. Consumerism encourages us to ignore the dreary cautions of reality until at least reality intrudes and the same dutiful consumers who fuel the economic boom are promptly berated by politicians and columnists for their fecklessness and irresponsibility. Drink responsibly. Gamble aware. The sombre cautions now tucked in the corner of alcohol and betting ads can only be in brazen contradiction to the messages above. The hedonistic party on the beach that accompanies a rum cocktail, the rainstorm of cash that falls on a successful accumulated bet, tell us that the true pleasures of drinking and gambling drive a freight train through responsibility and awareness, that our drinking and gambling selves know nothing and care less about the reality principle. 
Drink responsibly neatly concentrates the double bind in which consumerism has us hopelessly caught. Drink, yet, be responsible. Pledge simultaneous and contradictory allegiances to the selfish indulgence of Rameau and the austere self-discipline of Diderot. As chronically overextended citizens of the global consumerist economy, we know too well that this double allegiance isn't sustainable. Rameau's nephew hints at the insolubility of this predicament, the impossibility of resolving the competing claims of work and idleness. Rameau appeals to us because he dares give voice to the entitled slobs and wasters that in most of us live a more shamed and furtive existence. In his dedicated profligacy, we can discern the generous outlines of the Rameau of our own day, our living homage to sloth, waste, irresponsibility and infantile gratification. Homer Simpson. Snoopy, Garfield, Homer. Why should cartoons be such a fertile breeding ground for iconic slobs and wasters? Slobs are such stock figures in cartoons because cartoons, for all the painstaking work involved in their production, are the fruit of the most slobbish region of our imagination. This may seem a counterintuitive claim. The creations of Tex Avery or Hanna-Barbera are alive with manic energy, every frame a frenzied overspill of noise, violence and joy. But this is exactly what makes watching them such a blissfully sedentary activity. Bugs, Daffy, Tom and Jerry live in a world from which the tiresome constraints of reality, physical laws, morality, death, have been conveniently expunged. In this regard, they're an unexpectedly vivid illustration of Blanchard's idea of art as the ruin of all action. The cartoon world is the ultimate realisation of the imaginative realm as the inverse of reality. Reality is defined by material limits, by walls that cannot be walked through, bodies that cannot be repaired once they're cut in half. This world in which everything can happen is also one in which nothing can happen, in which there can be no definitive action. Kill or destroy, create or build all you like. It can all be reversed in an instant. In general, says Blanchot, the writer seems to be subjected to a state of inactivity, because he is the master of the imaginary. The truth is that he ruins action not because he deals with what is unreal, but because he makes all reality available to us. The writer does not work in a space of limits and constraints. In the imagination, he can do whatever he wants. A great example of this for Blanchot is the Marquis de Sade, who creates a corpus, a life, a world, out of the capacity to do exactly what we want, out of the realisation that there's actually nothing stop, stopping our imaginations from imagining anything at all that they want. Real life is hard work because there's so much that gets in the way of what you'd like to do, the limitations of your own body and mind and the obstacles of the physical and social world around you. Cartoon life removes those limitations and obstacles, inviting you into a world where you can do or undo anything without effort, where Rameau's bugbears of hunger, boredom and remorse have evaporated. Cats and ducks and people can be sliced, inflated, stretched, exploded, burnt and beaten with ease and impunity, unimpeded by the joyless finger-wagging of conscience or logic. This is how Homer's slobbery can happily coexist with a manic excess of activity. He can become an astronaut, rock star, hobo or mafioso without any of the annoying prerequisites of training or experience. Homer embodies the fundamental affinity between the slob and the cartoon, the fantasy that you can do anything without having to do anything. Homer is something like a pop cultural incarnation of the vision of the future, of the future sovereign man envisioned by Georges Bataille, in whom the drive to produce is swallowed wholesale by the drive to consume. The lurid, faintly urinal glow of warm colours suffusing the characters is a kind of atmospheric analogue to the nirvana of inanity 
by a bottomless abundance bestowed by a bottomless abundance of duff beer and lard lad donuts. These are the colours of contented suburban decadence, the landscape of easy gratification and casual waste. Perhaps this is why the show is so enamoured of scenarios of apocalyptic environmental spoliation, usually triggered by Homer. In one of the most uncompromisingly nihilistic episodes, Homer's aversion to disposing of his own garbage spurs him to stand successfully for election as Springfield's sanitation commissioner, winning over town hall meetings with the slogan, can't someone else do it? Homer's laxity and wastefulness spread contagiously through the townsfolk whose sanitation service now eliminates not only garbage, but any need for self-care. In an inspired fantasy of mass civic slobbery, men in epauletted sailor suits appear from nowhere to wipe sauce off the front of your shirt or dispose discreetly of your old porn stash. Inevitably, Homer's solution can only proliferate the waste he was elected to contain. He blows his office's full annual budget in a month and resolves the crisis by leasing the town's disused mines as an outsourced landfill for cities across America. The whole of Springfield promptly becomes a putrid dump, its parks, golf courses and eventually town hall itself gushing waste from geezers of backed up trash. The town is left with no choice but to transport itself wholesale five miles down the road. The episode presents Homer as the advanced guard of global consumer society's furious drive to waste itself, in the face of which the aims of responsibly managing and regulating waste come to seem comically futile. Homer's campaign may mimic the conventional rhetoric of a can-do politics geared towards fulfilling efficient goals, but it can barely conceal an underlying nihilism and irrationality. In Homer, the slob is revealed as the great anti-historical force of our time. His first appearance in the famed credit sequence sees him throwing a little rod of nuclear waste that's fallen down his back. The nuclear power plant at Springfield's heart is both the throbbing engine fueling its productivity and the always impending catastrophe of environmental and human waste, not least because only Homer is standing in the way of meltdown the slob keeping distracted watch on the coming meltdown. Is there a more acute image of the hair's breadth separating our supposed usefulness from the vortex of our wastefulness? The current imperative of ideology, currently deafeningly audible in all the main political parties' rhetorical valorization of hard work and the corresponding demonization of the shiftless, entitled and undeserving, is to set the useful and the wasteful in opposition to one another. In Emin and The Dude and Rameau and Homer, we glimpse a different, more uncannily intimate relationship between using and wasting time. <coughs> I thought this was good because I actually sacked off work tonight. <laughs> I mainly just wanted to point out that I don't. I do have a question there, which was, uh, you know, some people have written lately about the kind of more radical kind of time wasting. You talked about two things, and I think distinguish a little bit between them, though maybe not really, really uh, forcefully, which are like recuperation from work, like this viral video and stuff that people do, and then maybe a kind of if you're a squatter, you know, you have this typical yeah. Daily Mail outrage, like, I pay rent and they squat, but nobody said you couldn't just squat yourself. And that's kind of the thing you were talking about, this kind of dissolving of um, your symbolic universe or something. Mm. It's not really a question, but uh, that kind of, when you talk about Homer and the dude, and, you know, do you sort of see them as connected with a, a more radical idea of time-wasting? 
that's more important somehow than, yeah, I guess I'm asking you to speak a bit more about that. Yeah, 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 uh, that's great. And thank you for slacking off work as well. Um, it's really getting into the spirit of it before it's even started. Um, yeah, the, I think the interesting thing about the dude in home, particularly the kind of co pop cultural slackers, is that I suppose in psychoanalytic terms you'd call them something like a return of the repressed. You know, one might want to ask the question, how can it be that you have on the one hand this apparent kind of popular disgust at the idea of wasting your life away at this kind of um, uh, shiftless extravagance? And on the other hand, you can have our culture haunted by so many culture heroes who represent a refusal of all the imperatives that you know the Daily Mail rhetoric are supposedly standing up for. And not only that, of course, a lot of the people reading and sputtering along with the Daily Mail, perhaps even the people writing the articles, um, take no doubt take massive pleasure in these icons of wastefulness. And perhaps they justify that pleasure by saying, well, it's just a joke. Um, I think what the Cohen brothers are so good at, actually, is, is making the link between just a joke and a kind of nihilism. Um, that they insinuate this apparent kind of likeness into culture, you know, they, they make some movies, I mean, not all of them, some of them are actually quite, quite genuinely kind of disturbing. But in these comic movies, in which a lot happens in order for absolutely nothing to happen, like Lebowski or Burn After Reading, um, it's as though they present us with an image and a performance of a love of time wasting, of, a love of, of kind of draining away time, which is, I think, quite different from, as you say, something like recuperative time. You know, this is not about the movie as a bit of time out, a bit of recharging of the batteries. And one of the issues that comes up here, of course, is the um, increasing popularity of mindfulness, so-called mindfulness techniques, and the ways in which, um, uh, you know, Buddhist techniques of um, self-dissolution are now being um, appropriated by the corporate workplace in order, well, not actually to get in touch with this wasteful spot in ourselves, but on the contrary, to increase productivity. Um, and so there is, I mean, what is horrifying for me about mindfulness from this perspective is that it's actually about using time wasting usefully um, that seems to me to be a kind of you know not only a wonderful paradox but actually a great betrayal um, and, uh, and 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 uh, but also a lovely kind of symptomatic contradiction i thank you for that interesting talk what i what comes to mind is how do we define the work and what is expected from a day in the week. Mm -hmm. Those people, they define work as something going 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 or longer. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people who challenge this concept of work and they are freelance or they try to do the work differently, but they can't because they won't get the mortgages and things. Mm -hmm. So there is the attempt to live alternatively, still work, still have the time for pleasure, but whether this would be possible and also, this kind of stereotypes that you are bohemian, if you want, yeah. in a kind of negative way, not in a positive way. So that was interesting to see how do we define work. Is on one side, and then the way they can answer is just a bit common. Well, it's really interesting because um, the last talk I did was just a few days ago, and it was at an ad agency, and I, I was asked to sort of talk about, um, it was kind of in relation to the stuff I'd done on the private life, and, and I was talking with these very young, very young, um, in their early 20s, fashion bloggers, and um, they were freelance, and they 
had these kind of very edgy images. They were addressing, you know, quite important issues, body image, anorexia, um, depression, you know, and they were trying to incorporate that. At the same time, there were very canny young people who knew that they had to monetize the bejesus out of their own image and that they were actually serving corporate masters who basically, you know, the sort of the big magazines and the big labels kind of would use their images. Um, and, you know, when they were challenged about this or even challenged themselves about this, they acknowledged that um, there was a point at which their own kind of commitment to an alternative way of living, to a certain kind of freedom to make themselves in their own image was completely kind of um, uh, overwhelmed by exactly the pressures that you talk about, really. Um, there's no way, I mean, yeah, they can, they could, she could, of course, have squatted. Um, but there is this sense, absolutely, that the spaces in which one could carve out an alternative life, a life that isn't defined by the, um, the imperatives to work and produce, have, have been increasingly squeezed out, which is why perhaps they live on the margin, which is the margin of our imagination. In a sense, we can, you know, we, we, you know, perhaps one of the reasons we need Lebowski and we need Homer Simpson is because they kind of are the repository of our dreams of, 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 of being able to, to kind of do what we want with our own time and our own lives. Very much. It's been a great talk. Um, I think this is a slight extension of what the previous person was saying. Um, and again, I, I'm not sure if this is a question or just what came to mind during the talk was the ideas around motherhood. And I think a lot of, um, I, sp I, I, I suppose in, in, in the main media it seems to be split into a sort of time and production potential wasting um, that motherhood represents, or it's some sort of idealistic containment job that mothers do. Um, but I was very interested in a recent publication called, uh, which I haven't read by the way, called Who uh, Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, oh, yeah. which is a call for, just so that people know I'm having a conversation with myself, um, which is a call for consideration of voluntary work, of, um, I suppose, housework, mm -hmm. if you like, uh, to be given a value and included in the calculation of a country's GDP. Um, and Adam Smith was a, uh, an economic theorist who was um, and his dinner was cooked by his mother, <laughs> who he lived with uh, for his whole life. And so I just wondered how that came into it, because you're right, we do need perhaps the Homer Simpsons, we do need um, the great, the big Lebowski, and, and we also need Tracy Emin and her bed, and probably her mother as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, particularly because I also come at this as uh, a psychoanalyst who's very interested in mothers um, and uh, and the early the very early stages of life and the, the relationship between mothers and infants, um, and and also I mean, you know everything comes around again. This is a right revival of the the debate in seventies feminism about wages for housework, which I think takes on a new resonance in this context in the in the in this kind of discussion that we're having now because. Um, it does seem as though um, housework, or indeed the kind of um, the very different kind of rhythm of work as a mother, um, is different rhythm because, of course, it's controlled by something and somebody else. So it involves a kind of receptivity um, uh, to to another who 
you, you can't kind of direct in the way that you might like. Um, I, I know something about this. Uh, uh, so it it's interesting that it doesn't get talked about in terms of our kind of broad repertory of forms of work. Um, and when you think of all the different ways in which we've managed to monetize um, the different spaces of our lives and indeed of the world around us, you know, if you buy, um, uh, if you if you pay for your um, for your pay and display ticket now, you'll find an ad on the back of the um, of the of the ticket. Um, but somehow, you know, we haven't managed to do this very well. We've, that, that there is a certain kind of labour, a certain kind of work, um, which has been kept out of visibility. That's been kept out of um, our sense of what it is to work. And I just wonder if that's because there is so much affinity really particularly between the early stages of motherhood and time wasting um, it's it's very difficult work and I'm I'm absolutely not going to idealize it or um, uh, because actually it's the time wasting that paradoxically is so difficult it's it's sort of the the psychic the obligation to psychically enter into somebody else's world and give your in, into the world of a complete alien being um, with whom there is no direct discursive communication and and immerse yourself in it um, and there is something about that that can't be rationalized or instrumentalized um, and you know, as for Adam Smith's dinner, which is, you know, I mean, this is a much older infant that we're talking about, but, but maybe there is a kind of residue of that that persists through life, that means that motherhood becomes, you know, is, is an example of an invisible kind of labour, invisible because it can't really be instrumentalised. You can't sort of um, turn it into a sort of discrete, usable unit of, of time. Here you uh, speak of the idea of the flat earth in this context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Uh, I'm pausing only because it's it's such an important context. I mean, for I mean, I presume mo almost everybody knows, but the the flat earth is the um, the 19th century idea introduced by um, by the poet Baudelaire of the um, the kind of ragged bohemian city walker who who kind of drifts aimlessly so the flaneur is in a way the, the kind of the paradigm of the waster because he takes these walks he navigates the city but always without aim without purpose without direction um except of course that's the purpose and that's the direction um Um, but the, the thing that makes the Flaneur so relevant here is that he emerges from a culture that is, it's, it's, it's the first instance really where we, ex where, where the world around us is experienced as massively overstimulating, kind of, um, the flaneur lives in a world in which we, in, in which um, the citizen is bombarded with information, and you know, if we think about the great story by Edgar Allan Poe, the Man of the Crowd, there is that wonderful uh, description, which echoes also Engels' description of the uh, the new urban crowd, and the point is they're all zombie-like, right? They are directed this way and that by a kind of, I wouldn't say unconscious, it's more like a subconscious or subliminal logic 
which means that their consciousness is shut off, but they are walking like the walking dead. And the flaneur really, I think, is, in other words, this is a mind and a body that has been completely instrumentalized. So the flaneur is a gesture of de-instrumentalization. So, I mean, one of the paradoxes, I suppose, here in the talk I'm giving is that there is a form of waste that is also a form of exuberance and an affirmation of life in the face of a kind of usefulness that 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 um, that instrumentalizes life, and I think the flaneur is the kind of the, the first model of that. Um, but it, it's interesting that the flaneur is also somebody who complains all the time, um, in a way that echoes, I think, a lot of the laments about what our own virtual culture is doing to us. You know, Baudelaire's poems are filled with these splenetic complaints about um, you know a world that is making him sick really is making him very very sick uh, that is overburdening his mind and body to work first and then this kind of political force mark comes afterwards through the negation of, of, of that imperative or is it like a prior affirmation of life kind of tapping in to what you're saying at the, at the end there yeah that's interesting I mean in a way it's a question about what comes first yeah. um, now the, the Freudian line which Blanchet invokes a lot is that actually it's the inertia that comes first and life is rested from a prior inertia um, that, that we're always being kind of pulled back into. Um, so I think what, what Blanchot is saying is that that kind of enlightenment image of the productive human being of history is a kind of, it's a kind of illusion of a secondary mode of being as primary and that what art does is well, I mean he, he talked constantly about art's concern for origin so what art does is it takes us back to a kind of impossible origin in which there is no kind of um, initiating author there is no initiating actor there is just this kind of suffocating um, neutrality this, this um, uh, I mean, he talks about a kind of lassitude in, in being in which nothing is happening. And his, his feeling is that that is where art takes us, really, that, that art's ultimate itinerary is always towards that kind of um, uh, inertial, um, impossible beginning. Um, so... Um, in a way, it's not defined negatively in the way that it would in someone like Adorno, I think. Adorno would say always, the social comes first, and then there is this kind of art is then this um, critique in the form of negativity that comes afterwards. I think that the difference from Adorno would be that Blanchot is saying that actually, um, in some way, art is taking you back to something more original. And the reason it's so, it can be so shocking and disturbing it's precisely because it confronts us with an image of ourselves that we don't know at all and that we know very well, you know. So, I mean, that's why, again, so, you know, I, 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 want, I want to bring in these kind of iconic, incredibly familiar figures like Lebowski and, and Home Simpson because we're so familiar with them and, that they, and yet, you know, they give us an image of ourselves that, that in ordinary waking life we say, no, there's... They're nothing to do with me. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're out of time now, so can I just um, remind you to, if you can, to do it.
kind of ones of business to survey, so we're really grateful to do that. And uh, please join me in thanking Josh for a fantastic talk.